Welcome, everyone. I guess good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. We have people from the UK, the USA, and across Canada. My name is Rick Moss, and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships, as uh, Rochelle has already mentioned, at Jesse's Journey. For those of you who may not be all that familiar with Jesse's Journey, the organization began when John Davidson's son, Jesse, was diagnosed with Duchenne, and they realized how little at that time was being done to find treatments and a cure for this devastating disease. So John and Jesse set out to change that. And in 1995, John pushed Jesse in his wheelchair across Ontario. And then John walked across Canada in 1998 to raise more funds and awareness for this disease. Jesse's journey has become the country's largest funder of Duchenne research, investing almost $15 million in projects around the world. For more than 25 years, Jesse's journey has empowered patients, families and caregivers living with Duchenne providing a collective voice to advocate for access to treatments in Canada. We also provide educational information and resources for the Canadian Duchenne community through conferences, family forums, and things like this webinar that I have the privilege of introducing you to today. Today in our Defeat Duchenne webinar series, presented in partnership with PTC Therapeutics and Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, it's my privilege to introduce you to our featured speaker. Dr. Natalie Truba earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Western Michigan University. She completed fellowship training in pediatric critical care at Nationwide Children's Hospital and is currently an attending psychologist at Nationwide where she works closely with the neuromuscular team to support the mental, mental rather behavioral and emotional well-being of children seen in MDA and in other neuromuscular clinics. Today, Dr. Truba will introduce a basic conceptualization for understanding and making sense of emotional, behavioral, and cognitive challenges commonly experienced by boys and manifesting girl carriers. She will provide a broad overview of strategies that may help better manage challenging behaviors. Dr. Truba will also review insights regarding impact of COVID-19 and identify strategies for supporting adaptive coping and adjustment moving forward. Dr. Truba, thank you so much for making time for us today out of what I know is a very hectic schedule to speak to our Canadian Duchenne community, understanding and managing behavior in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We are really looking forward to what you have to say. So welcome, and I'd like to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you for such a wonderful inter uh, introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Thank you for inviting me to, to spend, spend some time with you today. Um, uh, uh, yeah, like like Rick was saying, I'm I'm Natalie. I'm a pediatric psychologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, and so my my hope today is kind of to share some insights um, and some sort of unpublished uh, observations that that we're seeing kind of in a way that that what we're doing in our clinic and and what's been helpful. Um, I'm happy to take questions or comments. I know that we work different systems here in the U.S. than in Canada and the U.K. And so um, please challenge me if, if some of the things that I say maybe don't aren't as applicable as, 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 as I think they are, um, because I don't know what I don't know. So I'm happy to, happy to, happy to be told. Um, so broadly, my, my goals today are um, to provide you, like, a, like Rick was saying, a, a broad overview of sort of Duchenne and how, how dystrophin specifically might be affecting the brains that to impact our, our kiddos' physiological and emotional behavioral regulatory abilities, provide some basic strategies that hopefully we can expand upon in our discussion at the end um, around what to do to help help these kids cope and, and manage themselves a little bit better and answer any questions that you might have. Um, so when I when I do these talks, I think it's always kind of helpful that you all have an understanding of how I think um, so that you kind of know how I scaffold and, and present information. And so I'm a, I'm a behaviorist, and in that sense, I do see and, and believe that everything, thoughts, feelings, and physiological responses, so biochemically, biophysiologically, synaptically, are all considered behavior, which means we can measure it, we can observe it, um, we can manipulate it. And in this sense, I am, I am particularly very interested in um, overt and covert behavior as it relates um, to human functioning. Um, and the, the reason why this is particularly important to me is that Overt behaviors are those behaviors we can see. These are the loudness of behaviors or the topography of behaviors. These are behaviors that, that impact your life and your functioning as parents. Um, these are crying, yelling, meltdowns, aggression, um, that getting stuck in those thought loops, those types of things. And those covert behaviors are those things we can't see. And these are, these are the ways that are, this might be how biochemically our body responds to certain things in the environment. 
this is how our brain functions, this is how biologically sort of our, our body um, or orients into and understands and perceives the world. And this is an important thing for me to talk about because in this sense, I am always much more interested in, and I find it much more helpful to focus on function more than topography. And that the reason why this is, is that all behavior is purposeful, serves some function, even maladaptive behaviors. And so humans are not creatures that just do things for no reason. There tends to be some sort of function that things serve. And in this sense, function is much more important in understanding these kids, kids with Duchenne and Becker and manifesting girl carriers, than, than understanding the descriptions of what the behavior looks like. And this is really important because um, many behaviors can serve multiple functions or one behavior can serve multiple functions, right? And so it's, it can be very confusing if we only look at what a behavior looks like. So a good example of this that I like to use is crying. Um, crying serves multiple functions. People cry when they're sad, they cry when they're happy, they cry when they're pain, they cry when there's something in their eye, they cry when they're overwhelmed, they cry when they're confused. If we assume everybody that's crying is depressed, we are probably gonna be wrong a lot of the time, but the ways that we try to help might be really invalid and consistent, make, make feel, people feel even worse. Um, and it might actually make the problem worse. So if, if I'm really happy and I'm crying and you treat me like I'm depressed, like that's gonna feel bad. If I have something in my eye and you don't help me fix my eye and you're treating me like I'm depressed, like that's not helpful. And so understanding why we're crying, the function that crying is serve, serving is a lot bigger bang for your buck than just knowing that someone is crying, right? And so we really want to understand the function of the behavior. So I talk a lot about a lot about that throughout this talk. And in this sense, the DSM is not really helpful to our kiddos because they do present as much more disordered life than full full blown behaviors. So we have to kind of start to think, what is it about these kids that they tend to cluster or have constellations of behaviors that makes them more at risk of certain diagnoses? And and I think that's valuable. But we want to be careful because how we label something determines how we treat it. And when we label things with um, descriptors such as ADHD or autism or OCD or anxiety, there are really good treatments for that that don't always help our kids. And it can leave you kind of in a, in a feeling kind of lost or and not, not as if you're getting the helper or you're doing something wrong as a parent. When none of that's true, it's just, it's, it's not, they weren't designed for kids that don't make dystrophin. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about, about that as well. And the other thing to know about me is that I do, um, I, I, I do understand humans and personality in the context of punishment and reinforcement sensitivities. And so these are things that about us that you just kind of like and don't like, and that is very in individual, right? Like some people love adrenaline and some people don't. If you, if you love, you know, social attention, right? So the, the act of receiving social attention is I'm, I'm doing something like right now, I'm aware that you all are watching me. It makes me nervous, but I kind of like it. I get like excited about it, right? So I kind of, I lean into it. I do a lot of talks and it's something that kind of makes me excited. So people have described me as extroverted or, or class clown or um, super social, that kind of stuff. Um, my brother, he, he does not like social attention and he has been described as shy or introverted. It's not that it's not the act of social attention, it's how we contact it biophysiologically, right? Like one of us likes it and one of us doesn't. And so that shapes our behavior, what we gravitate towards, what we shy away from, right? And over time, right, that kind of shapes who we are as people. And so there are boys who love the feeling of adrenaline. There's not a lot of them, um, but there are some kids that tolerate these processes better than others. That doesn't mean it maybe isn't happening for them, but there are individual individual differences within our in our populations because at the end of the day they're humans even though they maybe all have the same disease progression or same disease um underlying disease maybe not the same progression but the same underlying disease they may contact these internal experiences very different and so what we do know is that our boys are at much higher risk of certain diagnoses so in the duchenne population we see up to about 21 percent of our boys diagnosed with autism about 27% diagnosed with um, some form of, AD, of anxiety or depression, up to about 32% diagnosed with ADHD, about 5% diagnosed with OCD, and about 15% um, diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. Well, when we compare this to the normative, the non duchenne population, the neurotypical population, we see some very, very drastic numbers. We see autism about 1.7% in the normative population. Major depression is about 3.2 and any anxiety disorders about 
We see ADHD ranges from about 9.4 to 11 percent. OCD is about one to three percent, depends on the study. And oppositional defiance disorder has a very large range of three to 16, depending on who's characterizing that. So when we see these numbers, we should all be taking pause and kind of like, well, what's going on here? What is it about our boys makes them more at risk of being diagnosed with one of these disorders? So much higher than we would predict in, in, a, in the normative population. So what is it about Duchenne or dystrophin that is influencing them to a degree that they tend to meet criteria for sort of a more externalizing disorder or a more sort of anxiety getting stuck sort of disorder? Um, Anytime we see numbers like this, we should be worried, right? Is there something very disease specific here? And so what we know, as you all know, probably even better than I do, um, we know a lot about DP427. That is the dystrophin um, protein isoform that is expressed in our muscles in our body, right? Like here down, um, well, not in our brain, in, in our muscles. And so we know a lot about that. And what we know is this is a very large protein, the largest protein in our body. And we know how it interacts with muscles and we know sort of, ways that we can kind of help with that. What we know less about is DP260, DP140, DP116, and DP71, which are all expressed in the brain. And so not only is the, the what's going on in the brain um, very complex, um, but there's more, more moving pieces to it as well than, than what we know about the body. And so this is a, this is a convoluted thing and we're just starting to learn about it. Um, so I do hope I'm wrong about a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today, because that just means our science has gotten so much better and we're able to kind of better understand that. Um, wrong in a forward fail maybe way. I don't wanna, don't wanna be super wrong, but um, I think we're starting the foundation of, of the next wave of what, what can we do to help these kids live their best life and get some help, which is really focusing on the brain and the impact of dystrophin in the brain. And what it really seems to be happening is there's this, it's this, this combination of this impact of the, the brain body interaction at a physiological arousal level and their capacity for or ability to self-soothe and calm. And there's a couple of things that I think interrupt that, these processes. Um, so when we first start to think about arousal and regulation, what we're really talking about is the autonomic nervous system. And this is our system that controls autonomic, involuntary body functions of the smooth muscles. This is, involves our sympathetic, so our fight or flight, freeze response. This is dominant during periods of stress. When our sympathetic system activates, this is our, our mobilizing system, hormones are released um, that result in a few things pretty quickly. There's an increase in respiration, heart rate, and blood pressure, and there's a decrease in processes of elimination and digestion. So the, both of those, right, are, are issues that we that we observe in our kids regardless um, and that we, we wanna be mindful of from a stress standpoint. We don't wanna exacerbate underlying disease progression. And so um, there's there's multiple benefits to kind of kind of thinking about the brain body interaction for these boys in maybe a way that we haven't so deep yet. The second, the other system of this, and these, these work on two sides of the same coin, is the parasympathetic system. And this is the body's energy conserving system. And this is our system that is dominant during periods of relaxation and sort of rest. And so it is healthier to have your parasympathetic system more active um, than your sympathetic system. Um, but both systems are really important when it comes to learning um, and attention. And so when we talk about tension and attention and learning, we're talking about sort of frontal lobe functioning in a lot of ways. And you don't learn well if you're not attending. If you can't focus on what you need to focus on when you need to focus on and sustain that, you're not gonna learn very well. But also there's optimum arousal, right? So you have to be a certain amount of aroused to learn well, but if you're too aroused, that interrupts learning. But if you're too under aroused, that interrupts learning. And so there's a sweet spot where humans kind of learn the best, right? And when you're really hyper aroused or over aroused, that, that, that learning system is interrupted, right? Just from a, a brain scaffolding, a, a, a ability to sort of process, attend, structure, formulate, uh, commit memories, and then be able to subsequently recall them, that process, it strengthens those memory loops. And so that all gets interrupted. And so the, the arousal piece, we know little about, but what, we're, but what we do know is that there's something going on for these kids that makes it really hard for their bodies to kind of do that homeostasis as it should. Um, so when I first started working with these kids, um, I was doing a lot of evidence-based work, you know, they come in with these diagnoses like ADHD and autism and anxiety. And it's like, 
we've got a lot of treatments for this that work. I'm going to nail this. And what I was finding, I was making everything a lot worse. And so we, I went back to the drawing board and started um, using some biofeedback equipment to kind of get a sense of internally, maybe what these processes were like compared to other populations we have very good data on. And I started to see some really unique patterns in this population. Um, so the, 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 the image on that you're seeing um, is a, what I would call what I refer to as a window of tolerance or in psychology we call a window of tolerance. And everybody's window of tolerance is, is, is different. Right? Some people have very little windows, some people have big windows. It's better to have a big window than a small window. The things that help our windows be big are getting good sleep, getting good nutrition, not being in pain, being safe, those types of things. And the things that make our window smaller are the opposite. Um, trauma, those types of things. Uh, the reason why windows are, are important is because um, having a sense of, of where tolerance is or sort of what, what, when is your kid's capacity is really important to helping kind of get a better grasp on some of these littler kids sort of emotion dysregulation. And, and we're going to talk a lot about that in a minute. So when I first started seeing these kids, like I was saying, I saw some unique patterns. So when I say physiologically, I mean our body sort of communicating with itself. So these aren't necessarily measures of stress themselves, but they're measures of physiologically reactivity and how kicked up our body gets. So they're not cortisol levels is what I mean. What we're looking at is more biophysiological reactivity processing and that lets us know our body is very activated or it's less activated. And so this blue line is, this is a normative sort of way that bodies regulate throughout the day. These systems, the parasympathetic and sympathetic system works really well actually in, to create a homeostasis in the body effortlessly. So this is sort of our brain, brain body kind of working together to regulate. There's two systems. So our brain regulates and then our body from a muscular standpoint regulates. Um, this is why deep breathing and that is such a focus for helping people calm because breathing is what tells our brain we're either safe or not. It's what cascades and kicks this off in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you that are not carriers um, or mosaic carriers, if you're a mosaic carrier, I don't see this, um, but those of you that are not curious, your physiological pattern, unless you have an anxiety disorder, a lot of trauma looks something like this, where you kind of activate and then your body regulates during the day, you're, you're thinking, you're walking, you're challenged, you sit down, you might, your body will shut down and then something happens and it kicks up, gets you ready to do some stuff and it shuts down. And it's just regulating that for you. You don't notice it. This happens for all of us all day. You just, you don't notice it. it's outside of your conscious awareness. I walk to work. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a hyper person, but I'm, I'm not an anxious person. Um, so if I'm walking to work and I almost get hit by a car, I'm going to notice, I'm going to, I'm going to have a spike like this, right? My body's going to be like, whoa, got to get ready for something, right? That was really scary. I'm going to feel that probably because I'm pretty close to the top of my window. I might notice my heart rate increases. I might notice I get warmer. I might notice a change in my thoughts where I'm like, Hey, you fool, watch out where you're going. And I'm mad all of a sudden. Um, but I'm going to calm pretty quick because I'm not anxious. My body doesn't know how to sustain this. My body shuts down quick. People that are anxious, if, if any of you are anxious, what you'll notice if that happens, you might notice that you're, you're, you plateau a bit before you start to shut down because your body has kind of learned to sustain that level of arousal a little bit longer than, than mine has. And that's a really important piece to this for these boys, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, when I hook my boys up in my manifesting carrier moms, um, I see the following pattern. I have seen this in every single kid I've done this with. Uh, the, that isn't to say there aren't kids out here where I, where I wouldn't see this pattern. I just probably haven't met them yet um, because you're getting sent to me for a reason usually. Um, but so the pattern I see looks like this for these boys. Um, and this is very concerning because this is insidious. It happens kind of throughout the day, regardless kind of what's going on. They didn't almost get by a car, right? And their body's still spiking up. Um, but it also lets us know that it's not that their body can't regulate, right? Because it is trying to shut down. Um, but for some reason, it kind of kicked itself back up. And that happens slowly outside of our conscious awareness all day. And eventually, right, something little is going to set you off. And this is where you see those big meltdowns that seem out of the blue or over something small, like somebody touched their pencil wrong or something like that, or their socks are on wrong. And they're just really just right. And you're like, whoa, overreaction. Um, if any of you had a, have ever had a panic attack that's been out of the blue, this is a very similar physiological process for you. And so it just manifests very differently for these kids. And so um, I think this happens for multiple reasons. And it is really hard for them to self-regulate around. Um, it's really hard for them to kind of get control of this. It's almost as if their brain kind of gets hijacked a little bit. And the reason why I think that is, is there's something going on 
from a dystrophin standpoint in the brain. And that is something we are seeing in a lot of data right now. Um, but for some reason, it's kind of, their brain doesn't really habituate and it, it's kind of always on. It's always taking in a lot more stimulus than it needs to. So their brain is, is over aroused, it's bombarded, and it's, it, it's kind of hijacked in a way. And what happens is their sympathetic system is kicked on a lot more than it should be, right? It's kind of being told, oh, activate, oh, activate, 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 when it shouldn't be, when it should say, okay, we're cool. This is a cool environment. You can calm down. So I'm going to challenge everybody right now. So I want you to just open your ear, like kind of listen around you. If you're, if you can hear a fan or cars or anything that you didn't notice until I just asked you to do that, that's because your brain's doing what it should do, right? It's, it's habituating to that environment because you're in there and you're safe. So what your brain will start to do is it will not attend to things like noises in the street. It won't, it won't, it won't attend to things like fans until you try to listen to it. But for these boys, that, that doesn't happen. So their brains are always very aware of those things. And there's a reason our brains habituate, right? Because that is a very stressful way to kind of, kind of live life from a, from a sensory standpoint. Then we have the impact of the muscles. And what it does look like kind of happens, oops, in the muscles is that the breathing muscles are impacted. So they kind of develop this anxious style of breathing, even though they're not anxious, okay? So this, 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 chest sort of style of breathing where their chest is much more driving the breathing than their diaphragmatic muscles. And that I think gets in the way of the parasympathetic system shutting down or staying, sustaining that shutdown as it should. So what's happening is their body can shut down, they can regulate, right? Because our bodies can only tolerate being kicked up this long, but because of how their muscles are impacted, it kicks them back up kind of in, in, inappropriately, right? Their brain is like, oh, that means something's going on. But it, it, there isn't anything going on other than the fact that their muscles are weak. So they don't get good activation from their diaphragm and some other muscles. And so they tend to have this very choppy, more rapid sort of style of breathing. And over time, what, it, what I think is happening is we're seeing sort of learning at an opera in a neuronal level that contributes to the, a very small window right? So their window gets very small because when you live up there for a long time, it just kind of takes a toll. And when you have a small window and you're in that state, your, your brain starts to kind of be overly attentive to, to potential threats. And what starts to happen is you actually start to misperceive neutral threat, neutral stimulus, and, and actually positive stimulus as potential threat stimulus. And this is particularly problematic when your brain's already very kicked up, um, because sometimes some of the things that we do to help kids cope, right? Like talk to them gently when they're very, very heightened, like, hey, buddy, it's okay. You got to calm down. You'll hear them say like, why are you, everyone's yelling at me, right? Because their brain is in such a place that even gentle whispering feels like yelling to them, right? And so what happens is they have these anticipatory, right? Or even higher startle responses than we would expect because they're kind of primed because they've been living in this state. So their brain is just kind of knows to live here and it doesn't really know how to live lower. And they start to do some things to cope that are really odd, right? Or that um, we would say, hey, that, that seems disordered, right? But it probably is likely serving a function for them, right? Like organ aligning tends to be very soothing for them, but it does look very OCD-like. And so there are times actually that I found that, that treating some of those things isn't overly helpful because they are kind of functionally like helping themselves soothe. We want to make it less disordered, right? But we want to recognize that these boys actually do tell us a lot just not verbally because they don't really understand it themselves, which is fair because we don't really understand it. And so it's kind of a big demand to put on like a six-year-old to, to understand something we don't really understand. Um, but a lot of them do do things that seem not to make a bunch of sense to us, but do seem to serve some function for them from a coping standpoint. And this combination kind of leads to their behavioral phenotype, right? And we see sort of specific phenotypes. We see like four or five specific phenotypes and what I mean by that is kids tend to cluster, like we have our kids who are like, they melt down every day and they have cluster meltdowns. We have our kids who tolerate that a little bit better. We have our kids with some neurodevelopmental impacts and we have some kids who um, tend to have like a, a both and there. And so, and then there's like a fifth group that has a little bit more severe mental health Ill illness, um, but it's, it's relative, it's pretty rare in my experience. And so I tend not to focus on that in this talk, but I'm happy to kind of share my experiences after when we're talking, if, if people are interested. Um, and then what we do is we put them on steroids because they have to be on steroids. Um, but when you're already kicked up here and then you're on steroids, it just makes it even harder. And um, most adults at some point in their life have the experience of being on steroids and they can speak to that of, about how that's changed, how they feel and how they are, how grumpy they are and their 
you know, motivation for food and we're adults. And so they're just really, these boys manifesting care cares can be in just a really tough spot from what the demand from society and expectations age-wise, what they're expected to do and based on, in comparison to what they actually can do because of how their, how their brain is functioning. Um, and in this way, I do very much champion, I'm, I'm a, I really think we need to start to think about Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy as not only a, a neuromuscular uh, muscle weakness disease, but as a neurodevelopmental disease, because it does impact how the brain function. It does impact how they learn and it does impact how they see the world and structure um, their experiences. And so my hope is if you, if you take one thing away, I, I will hope you take that away and that this is very much related to disease and it is a very hard thing and, and it's nothing that anyone's doing wrong. Um, it's just a challenging thing to parent. And that's, you know, this combination of things, right? The brain, the body, um, is why we see behaviors like learning difficulties. Not only just learning in general, like specific, like math, right? But learning patterns, learning routines, right? Like our routine in one setting, they don't necessarily generalize to the other setting. So they do kind of have to have that coaching sometimes. So it's like learning and then applying it novelly. They have a lot of attention control difficulties or ability to express, suppress that extraneous background stimulus, right? So they're always like, what was that? What was that? What was that noise? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? So they're always kind of aware, right? So kids clicking their pencils, the light is buzzing at school, their teacher's talking, somebody's rustling their papers, all of that, right? They're trying to filter out and filter in as they're learning, which is just makes learning really hard. Um, they tend to have some unique in information processing and memory recall abilities. So when it comes to like direct learning in school where they're pretty kicked up, they don't have the best memories and their learning is impacted, right? So they might not be able to tell their parents, you know, what they learned in math. But what you'll notice sometimes and what a lot of parents here in our clinic will say um, is like, they can't remember what they did in math yesterday, but we'll be driving on the highway and they'll be like, hey mom, remember that time in like 2007 on Tuesday, September 16th, and we did this thing and they like went through it and their parents were like, I can't remember. So they actually do have some really good memory abilities when they're probably not physiologically overwhelmed, right? And so what you can see is these boys have these very unique learning abilities in some ways. And then in other ways where you don't really have to try and learn with kids, they really struggle. And that sometimes you're like, this doesn't make sense to me. We see a lot of sleep difficulties and difficulty winding down prior to bed. Um, there are some researchers interested in, in sleep and it does seem like there is something maybe that the role of dystrophin in, in sleep structure. And so I think um, that'll be a big, a big thing moving forward that hopefully science is, uh, other scientists are really delving into because sleep permeates everything. Like if you just aren't sleeping, you're gonna look very similar to a kid with Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy. And these boys don't sleep on top of having Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. So they're already, already like quadruply whammied when it comes to a, a, a human functioning standpoint. We see that lower tolerance for distressing experiences and sensory experiences like loud noises or bright lights or tactile, like the certain fabrics, that kind of stuff. Um, they have a lot of difficulty transitioning from tasks, especially when it's unexpected. Um, but even if it's expected, sometimes they just struggle to kind of transition from one thing to another. I mean, that is a, does kick you up physiologically. And if you're at the top of that window and it's small, even a small increase in physiology can kind of take you out of your window. We see what I have come to affectionately refer to as rage-like meltdowns that can cluster. Um, and when I say that, I mean, some of our boys get very dysregulated and they have these big sort of meltdowns where they're just out of control a little bit and that can happen you know a few times or for a few days kind of frequently and then they kind of so, kind of reset right they kind of deplete themselves um we're always trying to try to lessen that because that's something that is very impactful to y'all's lives we see a lot more selective mutism than you would anticipate in the normative population the non-duchenne population so we see a lot of that um more so than you would predict and I'll speak to that a little bit later. See a lot of that hyper-focus when doing things that they really like, like playing video games. You see that perseveration or getting stuck on future stuff. So this is where they're asking you, when are we going to grandma's next Tuesday? And you tell them, when are we going to grandma's next Tuesday? When are we going to grandma's? When are we going to grandma's? And they just keep, and you're like, oh my gosh, we've had, we've done this for like five hours today and I might lose my mind. Um, and then we see that OCD like behavior of like ordering, aligning, liking things very particular, like taking like five hours to get their socks on, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and what I want to do is I want to challenge us to reconceptualize some of these things. So if we think about how we're kind of understanding the brain and the body and maybe what's going on from a dystrophin, dystrophin standpoint, we can start to think about 
um, these first three kind of being neurocognitive manifestations, what we would expect to see neurocognitively when you're very, very hyper aroused, right? You don't learn well, right? You don't have good attention and your information processing and your memory recall tends to be very poor. And that's just when people are very kicked up. So, if, so somebody that's gone through big trauma, right? And they're really, really heightened. You would see, you would see that neurocognitive impact. Likewise, behaviorally, you would see these impacts. This is what happens when your body is overwhelmed and over aroused physiologically, right? You don't tolerate changes very well. You don't tolerate distress very well. You have a, a you're, you're more snappy, you have a shorter fuse. Um, you don't like changes, right? If you've ever been really stressed and you have a lot going on in life and you know, you've like cleaned your house and everything's kind of where you like it and you come home and you're like, who moved my base 30 degrees? That is not how I like that. Like who's touched my stuff? Because you're heightened, right? You're more sensitive to environmental changes. And so consciously you're going to be aware of things that normally you wouldn't even care about um, because it's just like, you're that sensitive because that's kind of how humans are when it comes to um, being overwhelmed. Selective mutism is like a freeze response, right? So if you think fight, flight, fight, freeze, some kids melt down, some kids freeze up, right? All of that is an indication of overwhelm, right? So if you're very overwhelmed, we would anticipate seeing that. Hyperfocus, perseveration, and OCD do seem very coping. So when you're very hyper aroused, what you're doing is reassurance seeking. You're looking for ways to self-soothe and to cope. Um, you tend to have an all or nothing. So when your brain is not shutting down, right? And you can't do an, you can't do an in-between, you tend to do an all or nothing. So you're taking in everything or you're taking in nothing, right? Except that one thing. And that is common across things like ADHD and autism, where the brain is very dysregulated in a lot of ways, which is something we kind of see in this population. Perseveration is very reassurance seeking. And OCD, I think is very self-soothing. And so a lot of times when you're seeing more of that OCD like behavior is when kids are a little bit more kicked up. And what you'll see is like list making, arranging their personal items, like wanting things very particular. Um, I call that wanting things particular like sex. We call that comfort chasing. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, something to avoid. Um, but so if we think about the behavioral concerns we see, right? When we think about how dysregulated these kids are physiologically, it makes sense. And it makes sense why they get so many diagnoses, right? When you go into clinic, you're describing behaviors like this, right? Depending on who it is, somebody like me, somebody like a social worker or a psychiatrist might pick up on different things, right? So they might say, oh yeah, this sounds like ADHD or this sounds like this or this sounds like this and now we're labeling it, right? But what we know is that when you're overwhelmed, this is what would happen. And so, um, it's important, right, just to, to remember that when we're, when we're talking about these things, especially as a, as a community and challenging ourselves to kind of maybe do better by how we characterize these concerns for our boys. And I don't think they're the most unlucky kids ever. I don't think Dave Duchenne and five standalone mental health conditions. I do think there's something very specific to Duchenne and, and why we see these types of behavioral presentations. And then you add sleep, right? And anybody not sleeping is gonna do, have these things, have these problems, right? And we already know our kids struggle with sleep and then we know these things are true. So they're kind of like quadruply whammied at this point, right? Quintently whammied. They have a lot of whammies against them when it comes to regulating. And this is important because good parenting tends to be reactive and that's not a bad thing, right? We don't overly parent helicopter parenting if you're too on it, right? You want your kids to learn. Again, there's a benefit from a self-regulation piece of your kids doing things and you being like, hey, I just caught you doing this thing. Don't do it again or X is gonna happen, right? Like that is where kids learn often to put effort into self-regulating so X doesn't happen, right? For these boys though, because they're so kicked up, they don't actually learn very well from those consequences because they're, that learning is occurring or not occurring in a place where good learning doesn't really take, take hold. And what I mean by that is what we tend to do is we tend to catch kids when their topography of their behavior gets loud, right? So this is when we start to notice it because it becomes bothersome to us or to someone around us, right? Or to the environment, right? So we can kind of like, don't poke the bear. When kids are chilling, we're like, oh, just let them be, it'll be okay. Um, but once they start to have more issues, that's when we start to be like, hey, seriously, don't do that thing again or X is gonna happen. And what we're doing is we're intervening here. We're intervening when it's to a point that they're not really self-regulating very well. And what we're doing is we're saying it here and then we say it here and we say it here. And unfortunately, by the time we see that we need to kind of rep, kind of reprimand or kind of put something in place for these kids, 
And we've kind of already missed the window where the learning and their ability to kind of learn from act A, B sort of contingent relationships is diminished. And so what we want to do is we want to shift to start intervening here. And so it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but it is challenging because it is a less typical way of parenting because we tend to parent reactively, which is great parenting. But for these boys, a more proactive parenting approach helps them learn better, although it is a much bigger demand on parents and families and schools and the adults in the environment because kids don't have control over that and they're not aware of these things happening in their body. And I find that they tend to struggle to learn to do those things if we don't take this approach. So they can learn them. It just takes a little bit longer um, than it would for other kids their age. And it takes a different approach. So right now, um, I'm shifting a bit. Right now, there's a lot going on that is gonna kick these kids up just because of the state of the times, right? So there's been a huge change in routine and what's considered normal in the context of this pandemic. This pandemic has been characterized by unknowns, sensationalized media and the spreading of misinformation, all of which have huge impacts on, our, on these boys who tend to have very fixed beliefs. They tend to be sensitive learners when it comes to potential threats, right? It's very hard to talk them out of a feeling threatened by something that isn't a genuine threat once they feel threatened by it. And the, the cumulative sort of response um, as a world has been distressing. And I think for these boys, been even louder. So I think they're contacting, they're very sensitive to other people around them um, and their emotional, emotional kind of reactions, including sort of you know, the zeitgeist of, of their community. And so I think there's, um, I understandably, but a, an increase in a lot of kids' anxiety when it, with, with regards to germs and illness and um, wanting to be safe from people, it totally makes sense. And there isn't a trusted roadmap for, for, that they can follow, right, that they've had before to make sense of these novel experiences. And these boys just don't do well with abstracting and, and accepting and sitting with discomfort because they, they have such a low window. And that is what kind of takes to, to manage things that you don't have an experience before that are scary, that nobody really has a plan for, right? That we're kind of learning as we go. And by when I say abstract, I mean, so abstracting is the, the ability to separate parts from a whole, right? And so they, they struggle with that. So it's that, that all or nothing thinking, they tend to kind of get stuck in that black and white kind of area and coping with things like a pandemic being like, okay, well, this is safe and this isn't safe. And this, is, that can be really hard for them just not shrink to them, right? So what do we do? There's a lot of things that we can do. And a lot of this is, is taking, being kind to yourself as a parent and recognize that it is hard to parent these boys. And, and stepping back and taking, um, taking consideration of, of patterns, of schedules, of things that we can do, not to get rid of some of the behavior concerns. I'll be the first one to tell you that that is not our goal. Our goal is to, to reduce the frequency that meltdowns or, or problematic behavior happens, increase sort of um, their ability to, to tolerate distress and space out, right, how, how soon these things happen together, right? So we wanna reduce the intensity and the frequency and we wanna make events not happen every day. And if we could get to you know, once a month or less than that, that's ideal, right? Um, because at the end of the day, they still have Duchenne. And I do think that Duchenne affects the brain. And so it is a large ask for them to kind of cure some of these behavior concerns, because what we know about humans is that is how we'd expect humans to behave when they're in that state of physiological dysfunction. So a couple of things we can do is stay ahead of the emotional behavioral meltdowns, like I was saying. Another term for this would be trigger management, as a lot of um, common nomenclature right now that a lot of people are familiar with. And for these boys, staying ahead is managing sensory and aversive stimulus, right? So what we know is their, their brains are very reactive. And so there are certain things that just they're going to regulate less well around. Um, having plans for that can significantly buffer and, and not just plans for managing, but plans for recovering. And that is a, a good place to operate. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but also distressing internal states like hunger or losing a game. So when you think about that window, right? If you're hungry, that window gets smaller. If you're tired, that window gets smaller, right? So activity pacing, you know, managing a good diet, a protein diet, something that kind of helps 
keep them out of that state of getting distressed over those internal processes is really important. Um, the reason I put losing a game is so it remembers, I remember to mention something about competition. I find that a lot of these kids do not tolerate competition well at all. Um, they tend to have a lot of behavior dysfunction around competition, particularly if they lose or even if they don't lose, just the process of competing is a very, a lot for them. So even small things like a lot of parents do in the home, um, oh, okay, let's race, who can get our toys up the fastest? Who can, you know, get to the kitchen? Who can do this? That that tends to kind of kick that up a lot faster. And then, you know, it might be fun and they're giggling and having a good time and then something happens and then they're like melting down. And so what you want, we want to remember is all arousal is arousal, good arousal, bad arousal, it's all arousal. Our body doesn't know, it's just like arousal. It's just, it's doing its thing. And so if overexciting our kids from a fun standpoint and it, like getting them all jazzed up kind of puts them in a physiological state that there was no party to go to. And so at other kids, you can kind of, expect that they can self-regulate that, right? And you can put in consequences for not doing that. But for these boys, it's so hard that once they're there, you really are kind of riding that wave until they shut down. And so even these strategies, when I'm talking about them are important, even on days that we're just doing all the fun stuff, right? And so being mindful that, that even excitatory, like, yeah, I'm excited about this. Like holidays, that kind of stuff, being around their cousins, they are going likely going to have more issues from a behavioral management standpoint as the day progresses. And the reason we take this approach is a couple fold. One is that it increases our distress tolerance threshold. It reduces the potential that we're gonna misperceive or contact neutral and positive stimulus as potentially threatening stimulus, which means we're going to better engage with and tolerate people trying to help us learn how to self-soothe and cope and regulate. It also increases the duration of time you have to intervene prior to a full meltdown. And so um, I'm not gonna lie, there are, when, when we mess up, which we will, because we're humans, that there are times that sometimes the best thing we can do, right, is just remove our kid in, into a, a space that's less overwhelming and just give them time to kind of let their bodies calm without that additional bombardment. And that in and of itself can kind of sometimes help us abort this versus kind of keep pushing them to do something that they really can't do and further spiraling and escalating that. This also optimizes their ability to learn. And so if we want them to learn to self-manage, we have to do that in a way that they're actually learning from consequences and can contact consequences in a way that they're going to be able to scaffold those memories and recall it and learn how to novelly navigate to avoid those consequences in the future. And so if we're not here, we're not, you know, we're oh, too high, we're not learning from those consequences as much as we should be. And so that's really important. So we wanna, we wanna maximize how, how our kids can learn to better cope with this and, and self-manage themselves. One of the best ways to do this, particularly in a pandemic, is to maintain baseline expectations for behavior and consequences for misbehavior. And so what we want to do, regardless of the situation, is we want to be as consistent and predictable and structured as possible from a disciplinary management and follow -through, consequential follow-through standpoint. Um, and this is because they just learn better that way. And it, it helps, as adults, it helps us uh, develop habits around kind of catching things earlier. Um, some ways to do that are structured schedules or structuring part of the day, right? So um, I, a lot, I have a lot, most people I have implement a structured break schedule where they're kind of, um, after we get a sense of kid patterns, we kind of build in structured breaks throughout their day. Like some kids need breaks every half hour. Some kids need breaks once a day. Some kids don't need too many breaks, right? Like they kind of have naturalistic breaks, like they can kind of recover pretty quickly between class or they can kind of recover in five, 10 minutes of, you know, just sitting on the couch with mom or dad, just kind of cuddled up. Um, but, but structured schedules are, structured break times are important um, because what, what we know, what we know is like their bodies can shut down and self-regulate, but they don't do that in environments that are still kind of overwhelming. And so kind of reducing that and kind of giving them a space that is stimulus free, like without video games, without electronics, maybe they're playing Legos, maybe a rocker so they can kind of get that movement because a lot of them like to move when they're kind of kicked up can significantly help kind of like facilitate that shutdown, which just gives them more window to build up into the next, you know, however long it is before their next break, an hour, hour and a half. And we build that around what their tolerance is, right? So I have kids who are very, very dysregulated and they go to school now three hours a day and they take Wednesdays off. But now we can tolerate the three hours a day where before we were unable to go to school at all. And so sometimes it is thinking about their specific patterns and designing the schedule around that. Um, because at the end of the day, what we want them to learn is how to live life with Duchenne. And um, 
this world is not designed for kids with Duchenne and helping them understand what they need to do to be successful is really important. And sometimes that is a, a stimulus management sort of intervention. We wanna develop schedules and routine to fit your new normal. Uh, unstructured and structured time to address emotions, thoughts and behavior can be very helpful for these boys because they tend to learn a little bit different or a little delayed. And so in a lot of the kids that I work with, um, where from a frontal lobe sort of development standpoint, we could expect some self-management to get really good around eight, nine. I find for these boys is a couple years delayed. So they're, they're way better at that at like 10, 11, right? And so sometimes it's being mindful of cognitively, they're able to do math like a third grader and read like a third grader and do all the things like a third grader, but they don't tolerate distress like a third grader. Well, that makes sense. And maybe a different approach is needed in order to help buffer that so that they can better tolerate that environment like other third graders, knowing that, that you know, that's a lot of ask to put on them um, because that they might have a little brain immaturity for some reason, like a little bit there in the frontal lobe for another year or two, right? So they're, no matter what we do, right? No matter how much we yell at them, no how much we put consequences in place, like they're just not capable of doing that yet. Structured time might involve specific exercises, labeling emotions, identifying, pro practicing like awareness of like tension and breathing patterns so that they can kind of get a sense so that when you start to help coach them and recognizing their signs and signals to, of over arousal, that they know what to attend to. This is hard for any of us, right? It's really hard for kids to do. Um, so that would be one recommendation. The other is unstructured time where maybe you use other fun things or um, kind of like assignment type things to kind of structure quiet relaxing time or as a break where they do journaling or they write stories or draw pictures of their feelings. You're just working on all the different ways that we can think about ourselves and our experiences to help give them different perspectives and different feedbacks um, into themselves that they can then use to share to you because it is hard for them to communicate how they're feeling um, it's hard for any of us, but it's really hard for these, these boys. And so kind of using those opportunities when you have a structured schedule to build those in, especially starting young can be really helpful because uh, it's a lot harder to implement later on in, um, when they're older and when there's a lot of more social stigma around certain things with, with emotions and, and being able to kind of contact them. And so uh, I find that kind of having some structured, unstructured time built into a schedule is very helpful often for most of these boys. Um, I'm a huge fan of token economies. I find they work really well. So I'm going to make a little plug about them really quick. Um, in addition to structured schedules, one of the ways that you can help structure your schedule or build these in is through use of a token economy. And token economies are, are a system of contingency management that are based on principles of operant learning or consequence-based learning. So um, how human, this is how we develop higher order complex behavior. And so um, these are where we have rules and, and those types of things. And so contingency management is really powerful for a couple of reasons. One, because it's, it's a really great way to facilitate learning um, because the strength of a behavior is modified through rewards and the rewards are motivated, are used to motivate effort and engagement. And so what, what I'm saying here is that for our boys, they are capable of doing the things that other kids their age do. It just takes so much more effort and brain capacity than they sometimes can give and or have. Not that they won't get there, right? But they just might take them a little bit longer. And the amount of effort they have to put in to do some of these things is so much more than other kids their age that we really are asking a lot, even though it doesn't seem like it. And the reason, other reason I love token economies is it reduces the potential that they're going to contact a neutral threat as a potential threat or, or a positive or neutral threat as a potential threat um, because we're doing less reactive and more proactive parenting. So in a token economy, you're not, you're not saying, hey, you did this, I'm taking your iPad. Or if you do that again, I'm going to take your iPad, right? Which is a threat, right? And we know that they're very threat sensitive. So not ideal. Um, and it does tend to kick kids up. Very few boys at Duchenne are like, oh, well, okay, let me calm down now. I feel a lot better. Um, but from an, when the token economy, we build in our structured time when we can access our iPad based on certain things, right? And so it's not like I'm taking away, you just didn't earn it because you didn't do X, Y, Z. However, if you get it together, you can earn your next one, right? So there's all built-in motivation to put the effort in to getting it together, to being compliant, 
to doing what you need to do in order to kind of gain access to the things you want. And that's the other reason to have a structured schedule. The other nice thing is this token economies offer improved continuity of behavior management across home and school and like places like in-laws or, you know, aunts, uncles, babysitters, other people that you may have taking care of your kids um, because you can incentivize certain ways of behaving across different places that kind of accumulate to other goal or other sort of rewards. And it helps with communication across those places too, because you can kind of look at the behavior plan and say like, oh, you did a great, great job at in class today, right? Like you got your, your start for class, right? And so you're, rewarding what you did at school at home and at school. So um, it's a, it's a, it, they tend to work really well. You could also use it as a monetary system within your home um, for kids who want bigger rewards, right? So if they want a video game, if they want uh, special snacks, stuff like that, you can kind of um, attach a, 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 a value to that, right? Where it's like, oh, you need to do these three homework assignments if they're caught, not caught up on homework or if they really need to practice something, or if they need to wear their AFOs, or they need to do a caucuses, right? You can kind of use that as like, that's how you earn, right? To, to get exit, access to these things, because it does take effort and it isn't something they want to do, right? And it's not something other kids have to do, right? So we should incentivize it to a large degree. The third reason is because you can target things across your children in a way that feels fair, even though you're targeting different things. And so you can individualize token economies so that, you know, one kid, you know, your non Duchenne kid maybe is working on this and your kid with Duchenne is working on this and they're both being rewarded for like the effort they're putting in these different ways, right? Even though they're working on different things and that doesn't feel as unfair to them, right? Um, just because one of your kids doesn't have Duchenne and can regulate better doesn't mean they should get all the rewards, you know, and your other kid doesn't. And so it's a, it's a way to kind of, it's a way to kind of take some of that burden off you as a parent and, and feeling like you're making things fair from an attention standpoint or helping your other kids work on things that they can do right, to shift how their siblings engage them. Uh, like little kids, um, one thing I hear a lot is, my younger kid doesn't have Duchenne, my older kid does, my older kid is really mean to my younger kid, but my younger kid has started to be able to push my older kid over, even though they're like three, right, and that's really dangerous to my older kid. So we'd want to kind of train this younger kid to not push this kid, right, and which is a different, that'd be a different intervention approach than it would be for your kid with Duchenne to, to not pick. Right. And so we would target that different. Right. And they both take effort, but it's different. And so we can kind of do that in a way that still allows them to earn similar goals or rewards, even though they're doing different things. We always want to focus on their ability to endure and live life. Right. And so from a we want that resiliency or that growth mindset because we cannot predict everything. We cannot control everything, but what we can control and plan is how we respond and what we do to help ourselves. And, and having that is really important because it is their responsibility at the end of the day to put the effort in to doing these things. Because as children developing into adults, they will be expected to do that as adults. People are not in, in the general populace, they're not going to say, oh, okay, we have Duchenne. So like, yeah, act however you want. That's not how it's, that's not how it goes, unfortunately. And so we might not always be able to say, we can control everything. I can't control if something startles you, right? I can't control if somebody's mean to you. Um, but what we can control is what we do to cope with it and to, to move past it. And that is always an expectation we wanna have for our kids, even if it's really hard for them. So developing a plan for what to do, right? The steps we take when, we're, when something unexpected happens or when something's stressful can be incredibly powerful because what we can do is develop habits and we can use sort of their rule governed behavior to our advantage, right? So when this happens, I do this, I do this, I do this. They tend to learn pretty well in these rule ways. And so it can be really helpful for you all as parents in helping kind of get your kid out of either a, a cluster, potential cluster event, right? Where now they're just regulated and we're just gonna have to ride that way for the foreseeable future, hours, days. Um, but it also helps you recover and reduce that latency between events, right? So if we can kind of interrupt that process earlier, right, we're still gonna probably have some issues, but hopefully it's a lot less intense and, and it, it doesn't last as long. The other thing that can be really helpful here is a list of positive self-talk statements. So like, what can I do to coach myself through this? What are the things that I can do to self-soothe? Like, how do I shift attention? How do I distract myself? Those are things that a lot of kids learn indirectly, right? Like through watching people, through their experiences at school, through their experiences socially, that these boys tend to miss, not because they can't get it, not because they're slow, but just because there's they don't learn as well in those environments where 
kids tend to learn that it is indirectly. And so sometimes it does have to be directly taught, like, hey, in your head, I want you to do this, this, and this. And they kind of need that in order for them to kind of know to do that. And so it can be really helpful um, to kind of pair those together. So we're always expecting that we're going to make it through, that we can do this, right? It might not be easy, but I know we can do it with the self-talk statements to help them scaffold in here, since that can be challenging for all of us. But for these boys, from a belief standpoint, when they get spiraling, they get spiraling. And so if they don't have another way to do that, they're going to keep doing where their brain goes automatically. And that does need to be directly instructed often. And you always want to practice during non-stress times. And so if you're only practicing when they're distressed, you're like, hey, you seem upset right now. Like, what are like do your self-talk statements? That's not a good time to practice because they're just not going to learn as well. And we want them to learn to self-implement, right? And so we want them to do that before they actually need them or before they think they need them, right? Because they're not ever going to use them before they think they need them if they haven't been trained to do it during periods outside of high distress. As parents, modeling adaptive coping behavior is incredibly important, especially when you're stressed or distressed. Because what we know is the most predictive, um, the most predictive variable about kid coping is parent coping. And so uh, it, in our clinic, if we have kids who are really dysregulated or we're having some very atypical behaviors, right? We do assess parent mental health because what we know is that when parents are depressed or anxious, we are much more likely to see dysfunctional behavior in our kids, especially one, because that's just how kids and parents are. But two, for the kids with Duchenne, they are very sensitive. Um, physiologically, right, to, 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 to people. And so when you are not okay, they, they feed off that. If you are a manifesting mom, this is 10,000 times more true for you. And so what you see is this do, 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 do. And I, when I hook my moms up to my biofeedback equipment, that's the pattern I see is that, you know, they get as they're, they're going, the kids going, they're just feeding off each other. And we see that in general with moms and kids, but for these, this population, it just tends to escalate things. And so very quickly, even though you don't, you're not mad, you don't feel, you're just like, okay, we got to go. We got stuff to do. This is this, it, that in and of itself can kind of sabotage your kid. Not, not, a, not in a way that you're like, haha, I want to make my day, kids day hard, but just in ways that you don't even realize the influence you as a stimulus property can have on your children. You want to fight the urge as best as possible to give in to those constant checking or reassurance seeking behaviors, right? Like when are we going to grandma's at 10? When are we going to grandma's at 10? Um, or comfort chasing, where we're kind of rearranging our socks for hours at a time if you have older boys or men. Um, and the reason is because providing reinsurance only serves to unintentionally reinforce reassurance seeking, which makes it more likely in the future that they're going to reinforce reassurance seek at a higher rate. Okay. So if they're like, when are we going to grandma's? And you telling them we're going to grandma's at Tuesday at 10 actually was effective and helped them they would stop asking the question, right? But what you'll see is the more you do that, the more they ask, right? Because what we're doing is we're training them physiologically to not tolerate the stress associated with being like, okay, I wonder, I wonder if we're still going at 10, right? And a better approach is coaching them through that. Like, oh, I already told you, I'm not telling you again, right? Like what time did I tell you earlier? I'm 10 o'clock. Okay, cool. Good job. Right. And you tell them once a day and you move on. Easier said than done because these kids can be persistent to say it kindly. Um, and I will be, you know, I give you permission to put in earplugs and or noise canceling headphones if you need to and let them know, like, I am literally going to ignore you because I've already told you and I know that you know because you've told me. So I'm not going to respond to you this anymore. A good, another good way to handle that is scheduling worry time. So again, using rule governed behavior to our advantage. Um, but a lot of the boys do kind of get on board with or tolerate well kind of scheduling worry time. So if your kid's a big worrier and they want to talk all their worries out, Sometimes being like, we're set a timer for 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about your worries, and then we are done. Like, you can talk about them, but I'm not engaging with you, and I'm not gonna respond to you, okay? Because we already talked about our worries. And what we're doing, if we just keep talking about our worries, is we're kind of like reinforcing that we should be worried about them. And what we wanna do is say, nope, we already talked about them, you're fine. I know you're fine. I'm fine knowing that you're fine. So I'm not gonna validate your distress. I'm not gonna engage with you that that is a fair thing for you to be this distressed about, is the message we're sending as parents. Um, another way, would be um, to start a worry jar. And this is sort of, you know, if your kiddo struggles with that or you're like, I don't really want to ignore my kiddo and they're worried. Another way to be like, hey, write them down, put them in the worry jar, right? And at the end of the day, if you're still on your mind a bunch, we'll all look at them, right? And we can have another, we can talk about them if we need to, right? But I'm not talking with you about them until 
that time, but go ahead, right? Put them in your worry jar. It could be an online worry jar. It could be, you know, if they're still writing, they could, they could do that or they could type it. Um, most times they don't really want to go through it by at the end of the day, right? There's just kind of seeking assurance, reassurance, reassurance. Um, but this also you can use to kind of shape a letting go sort of ritual or, or you're teaching them sort of how to like acknowledge their worries and then like set them, set them aside, right? Because the act of them writing their worry down is really no different than them telling you their worry, right? Other than they're not getting the social feedback and the social reassurance provided. And so what it does is it kind of helps them helps their, trains their body to kind of tolerate sitting with that, right? A lot better than if we were to just continually focus on it. Letting go is really helpful. A lot of these kids do struggle to let go. So again, training that, right? Like how do we let go? How do we move on? Can be really, really powerful. It does take a lot of work, um, but a worry jar can be a good way to start with that. Schedule breaks and take them. Um, take unplanned, unplanned breaks as needed. So your scheduled break schedule, once you identify that, everybody's is kind of different. Like I was saying earlier, is something you implement, you know, to the best that you can, like 365, 24-7, right? So if it's a school day or the weekend or Christmas or a wake or you go to the zoo all day, right? Like if your kid needs a break every hour and a half, your kid needs a break an hour every hour and a half, right? Even if it's really fun. And what I hear a lot of families say is like, yeah, a great day. We like woke up, we saw our grandma, we went to the zoo, we got lunch. We like came home, we like did this thing and then we're getting ready for bed and they're just like biggest meltdown ever. Well, that's a really busy, arousing day. A lot of excitement, right? It is unlikely that at the end of the day with them being here, even though it's all positive, that that is gonna go well, right? So schedule breaks can help keep those fun times fun without them seeming to sabotage it at the end of the day if, you're, if you notice that in your own life. Take a hawk for media consumption and be a hawk about what your kids consume, especially related to the pandemic, because not all information is helpful and they have very sensitive belief development systems. And once they are kind of have a fixed belief or something, they're like, well, this is what I heard, this is true. It can be very, very hard to shift them away from that. Um, and that could cause a lot of distress for you and for them and unnecessary suffering because they can have beliefs that just are not helpful and very, very, very off from, from what you as a parent uh, would want them to know. Get outside and make fun happen. I think a lot of the kids, um, a lot of the kids I see anyways, kind of see themselves as not being able to do a lot. And, you know, parents kind of say, well, there's not much they can do. And so, you know, we just let them do this. We just let them do this. And they hear that. They hear these messages, right? And so it's kind of nonsense, right? For us to give the messages, well, you can't really go up the stairs by yourself. And you can't really, you know, and do this by yourself. And you need help doing this. And, you, and then also we're like, why aren't you self-regulating on your own? Well, it's like they don't get messages they can do anything on their own, right? Without help or without support or well. And so to all of a sudden expect them to do this thing, right? It's kind of a, doesn't make a ton of sense. And so we want them to know like, this might not be easy, right? But the expectation and, and is there and, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make fun happen, right? Like we're not just gonna sit and do this all day. Or if we are, we're gonna, we're gonna make it worthwhile and not just something because we can do it and it's easy and it doesn't take a response effort or creativity, right? It's low hanging fruit. I mean, do low hanging fruit stuff, don't get me wrong. Um, but using play and fun as an opportunity for them to see themselves as resilient and capable of doing things they don't think they can do can be very, very, very powering from an, an empowerment standpoint. Practice kindness and compassion towards yourself and others um, is important because in my experience, parents with Duchenne get a lot of feedback and a lot of um, advice um, from other people based on how their kids act, that is well-meaning and well-intentioned, um, but not necessarily helpful because kids with Duchenne are just a, a little unique. And so, you know, know that um, it's not anything you're doing. Duchenne is, is, a hard, is a hard thing to manage and does have a very hard behavioral phenotype associated with it. And so being grateful for small things can, can really buffer that. I like a three to one ratio, right? So if there's one thing you, you're like, oh my gosh, negative, find two positives immediately, right? And, and most parents can do this. And that's a good thing to kind of teach your kids as well, because they can kind of develop that internal monologue of like not kind of being able to do anything or not being able to problem solve. And I always need help with this stuff. And so that can be a really kind of valuable mental activity for them to engage in with you. Um, 
as we look to transition back to normal, a couple things. So um, I, I, I believe in Canada, you guys are still doing mostly remote learning and, and are on a much bigger lockdown than we, we here are in the US. Um, and so transitioning back to school, I think is gonna be rough for a lot of our kids um, for a lot of reasons. So I think transitioning back to school should be thoughtful and planful and might need to be kind of dosed, right? Because we don't, what we know is if we flood, it can take us a long time to recover. And so sometimes it's better to kind of inoculate, right? And, and kind of take that slower approach for these boys. And that is okay. And, and something that we see a lot or not, maybe we don't transition back to school. Here in the States, um, we have a lot of kids who are thriving at home out of remote learning. They're learning better. They're tolerating the learning process better. Their, their work is better. They're seeing, we're seeing some huge performance gains, which to me makes a lot of sense because the school environment is very overwhelming. And so my you know, I, I've always kind of talked about how I don't think kids learn as well in the school. These kids don't learn as well in the school environment as other kids, just because it's overwhelming and that's just not where we learn really well. Um, and so there, you know, there might be a benefit to a blended model for these boys or a way that we could advocate so that, you know, they're having the same sort of learning capacity advantages that other kids their age have. And it's just very unfortunate that if being in remote learning is facilitating improved learning, um, that we would force them to go back into an environment that we kind of know their brains really struggle to tolerate to begin with. There is a real concern for germs and illness and a real risk associated with trusting others now. And this is something that we're seeing a lot of, I imagine you all might be experiencing as well, um, is that it, you can't shield your kids from the fact there's a pandemic in how communicable diseases sort of work. And a lot of the boys are very stranger hesitant already and even more so now. Um, there are more illness, sort of germ OCD-like things occurring right now, which I think makes sense and is fair. And so if you are in that position, that is a place that um, traditional mental health therapy can be rather helpful in helping, especially those older boys and, their, and men in their 20s, I see this more in, as, in college age guys, um, helping them kind of work through for the first time in their life, like not, feeling comfortable like seeing some of their doctors or seeing people in their family or that because they have been terrified that if they were to get COVID like something really bad could happen to them which is fair right it could and so um it's a lot when you need other people to help take care of you to to kind of be like well just trust everybody that they're going to keep you safe right um so understandably a little bit more anxious there media depiction is still influential and so I do very much encourage being mindful of what your kids are hearing and, and learning and, and if there's a way to kind of stay ahead of that or to quickly kind of get on and be like yeah I'll got to talk about that um I encourage you to do that because while we don't want to lie to them um over flooding them with information depending on their age and developmental level also isn't helpful um when they struggle to abstract or maybe sort of separate pieces and holes if if we don't do that in a way that developmentally supports them in recognizing that this, there's not an all or nothing associated with this and we are very much in the gray. Um, likewise, there has been a pretty decent impact on beliefs, right? Um, and rule governed behavior. And so now we wear masks and we do this and we do this, that is changing or might be changing in Canada eventually, which they're likely to struggle with because they're probably adjusted in many ways to how life is now and asking them to go back into this less safe sort of position is a big ask. And so understandably transitioning slowly in a way that we have expectation. I'm not saying they're gonna like it. They're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to feel anxious about this. So maybe we don't like put them in the mall right away or the supermarket or something like that. But maybe we, you know, start by, you know, dosing with a grandma or uncles or aunts or something like that, where we're being safe and trying to get back to that social acclimation because that will feel very loud to them right, to all of a sudden be surrounded by people again. And so being mindful of that, because the, remember, once we're here, we're here. And so we don't wanna flood them to here and then expect them to tolerate more. It's just not gonna go well. And so being mindful of that, okay, how am I gonna think about getting them back into daycare? How am I gonna think about getting them back into school? How am I gonna think about having them around people who aren't giving them space when like the rule is six feet and they're like, well, that's the rule. So like taking, kind of taking stock of that now before things open up, and having a plan for that, that kind of the other people involved in caring for them um, can be really helpful because then we can incentivize like effort and willingness to participate and engage in these things so that we can start to help them build that tolerance back up and that willingness to kind of get back 
into some societal norms. The concept of physiological impact, um, prime for pandemic trauma is a, is a term that a lot of parents ask me about. I genuinely don't know. I think it was reasonable and logical to assume that there is gonna be a lot of kids who are more physiologically vulnerable for a while, um, or at least until their bodies kind of have a, a significant period of kind of learning to kind of live at a lower spot. Um, and you know, given that, then it would make sense that we would see some pandemic trauma, right? Where anytime somebody's sick, they might have a much bigger reaction. They might feel a lot more scared. And so again, imagining the school system or if there was siblings and they have a cold and how that might be influencing them physiologically, even if they're cognitively not thinking about it, right? So they're not necessarily anxious in here. They're not gonna tell you like, I'm so anxious, right? But their body is going to be reactive, right? Which just puts them in a vulnerable place to, to not manage themselves as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that, right? And again, kind of working on structuring schedules now to kind of think about how are we gonna manage this and what are the things, how do I want my kid to be trained to, to, to do this, knowing that no matter what, it's gonna be hard. But if we just like throw our hands up and let them do whatever, we know it's gonna be a disaster. And so trying to kind of corral that a bit can be really helpful. Um, and then that's a plan that you can give the school and these other places so that there's consistency across that because any inconsistency in that piece, particularly around like how schools are supportive, how families are supportive, um, can really derail things, right? So, you know, teachers that are overly authoritative and there's like, just my way or the highway, these boys tend not to do really well with, right? So a lot of parents tend to be very mindful of um, those teachers that are a little bit more patient and uh, able to kind of work around that and don't have like more of a militant style. So it's kind of a similar approach, just thinking like, this is kind of what my kid needs, Right, and how am I gonna build this into a schedule to kind of help mitigate some of these potential concerns in, in a way that the demand is not on the kid, right? Because they don't have control over some of these things. Thank you so much.